Welcome to Level Up Tribes. Level Up Tribes provides resources to help you attain the necessary resources to level up your mind, body, and soul and realize your full potential. It is about exploring, learning, providing you with the tools from the experts for you to create a better version of yourself. I am your host, Agnes Goodwine, and welcome tribes. Today, I have a special guest, Sharon Skinner. Sharon holds a Bachelor of Arts in English and Master of Arts in Creative Writing and a Poetic License. She writes fantasy, science fiction, paranormal, and the occasional steampunk for audiences of all ages. Skinner is an active member of the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators and also serves as their regional advisor. She is the author of the Healer's Legacy series, The Nelic Stones, Mirabella and the Fate of Phantom, Collars and Curses, and the children's book Rocket Shoes. Welcome, Sharon, to Level Up Tribes. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I'm excited, too. So let's start with who Sharon is and your background as an author. I actually started wanting to be a writer when I was a kid. And I always said, I want to be a writer and an actress when I grow up. And I got into community theater uh, for a while. And when I got going, I was kind of discouraged from acting and writing as a career because, you know, it's so hard to make money and so competitive and that sort of thing. So I went on my merry way and I did a lot of different things, a lot of different things. Like many authors, I have had many, many, many jobs. It's very interesting if you look at our work history. Many of us have had many, many, many jobs, odd jobs. I've landscaped and I've been a maid and I've, I mean, it just, I, I worked in a grocery store. Oh my uh, God. Yeah. So, uh, but I finally settled uh, in the grants profession and I woke up one day and I said, oh, I am a writer, but this is not the kind of writer I had intended to be. This is technical writing. This is not fiction writing, which is what I had always wanted to do. So it was at that point in my life that I decided I'm going to start focusing more on the fiction writing and become an author, which is what I had always intended. Can you tell us about your childhood and how that was like? I'm so curious about that little girl. So I learned to read before kindergarten. I was born after December 1st. So back then, you didn't get to go to kindergarten until you were five. Hmm. By then, I could already read. I could do math. I could do a lot of things. So I was a little ahead of the curve on those things. Plus, I had an older brother, so I learned watching him learn. And I became a voracious reader. I loved books. My favorite book at the time, early on, was Harold and the Purple Crayon, which has almost no words. And I was telling someone the other day, I am Harold now. I always wanted to be Harold I, because he made up such great stuff just with a crayon. And he went into these wonderful worlds just that he drew with his crayon. And I always wanted to be Harold. And I feel like now with my books, uh, in a way, I am manifesting my own inner Harold. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but anyway, when I got a little older, um, I read so much that I, and I was very shy, so I didn't have a lot of friends. I was awkward. Uh, my books were my friends. And my mother used to tell me, oh, you need to go outside and play. You need to go outside and play, get some sunshine, some fresh air. And I would say, okay. So I, <laughs> I pushed the corner of the screen out of my bedroom window and I would drop a book out into the garden, into my mother's begonias. And <laughs> <laughs> I'd say, okay, mom, I'm going outside now. And then I would go get my book and I would hide somewhere and I would read. And that's all I did. Did you keep up with characters in your head at that young of an age? Did you make up, you know, different characters or did you draw them at that time? Uh, yeah, I started writing out full stories. When, when we were in grade school and I don't know about nowadays, but when I was a kid, we had this big paper and it had three lines on it because for penmanship you had to learn how to do penmanship and the lines were two solid lines with a dotted line in the middle 
right? Mm -hmm. And it was very big. It was like, I don't know, an inch tall or something. And I used to write tiny on every single line and just fill pages and pages of this big paper with stories and pictures to go with. And I was always taking my characters to outer space and they had unicorns and dragons and all the things. So how was your support from your parents? as a kid and having this huge imagination. My mother used to say that I had the imagination of 10 children. <laughs> and I don't know if she always meant it as a compliment. <laughs> uh, but there were there were six of us and it was a lot to keep track of. So my, my mother did encourage me in the arts, but not as a career path. You know, she encouraged my creativity uh, when I would do the clay sculpting at school and bring home the weird stuff that I would make and uh, things like that. And she did encourage me to do those mm-hmm. things, but uh, not, not actually as a career, okay. which is interesting. Yeah. I know with my two sons, they're both artists. And I saw that at an early age. And so I would try to buy them anything, any crayons, you know, pencils and just to try to develop that um, at an early age. And my oldest one actually makes a living out of it, um, which is pretty awesome. And so I want to get back to, you know, the support of parents. How important do you think it is for a parent that sees that creativity out of their child at that young age to continue to develop that? Going back to that, I my parents, my, my dad was a truck driver. We didn't see him a lot. My mother, though, was around, and she was very encouraging for us to be creative. In fact, she went out of her way to make sure I had access to dance lessons. So I was a dancer. I did tap and ballet, and I was on point for a while. I, you know, I did some acrobatics. So those kinds of expressive things that we wanted to do, we, I sang with her in the Sweet Adeline's Chorus because she was part of that, and she would take me with her. And it was a, it's a women's four-part harmony chorus, so I would sing with them. So she did in, encourage us in music and art and all of those things. But again, at that time, people weren't encouraging their kids to go out and make it a career. Uh, the average person wasn't making a living as an artist. And I'm so happy that your son is making a living as an <laughs> artist because many artists still have day jobs. Well, he does. He has a day job, but he, he does very well with his art. But he's, he's doing well, and that's yes. good uh, because many of us, we do okay, but we still have to have a day job. There's so many things about you, Sharon, that are just so interesting, and one of them that caught my eye was that you were one of 45 Navy women deployed to sea during the Iran hostage crisis. Tell us about that experience. I'm wondering, as a writer, did you have time to explore your creative writing during your time at sea? When I was in the military— It was a time when women didn't, we weren't, (laughs) I don't know how it is now. And I, and I assume that it still has, has a ways to go for real equality. But back when I was in, it was a difficult time for women. Mm -hmm. And we were part, those 45 women, myself included, we were part of the first uh, crew that took a, a women on a full six month Westpac cruise. So prior to that, they had taken some women out on a short um, sit rep on a ship, which I think was 10 days or something. It wasn't very long. So we went on a full six-month Westpac cruise. Now, the Navy did their due diligence. They they went through and did a lot of educating of the male crew members before we arrived. But it was still a difficult time. There were only 45 of us on a crew of 898 or something like that. And... uh, it was, yes, during the Iran hostage situation. And we were we spent t- two and a half months in the Indian Ocean at a little island called Diego Garcia, the footprint of American freedom, which was fabulously gorgeous because it was so pristine. It used to be copra plantation. Uh, it's British Indian Ocean territory. But uh, <laughs> there was no fraternization. There were very strict rules. There were a lot of things put in place to make sure things worked. The great thing about it it, for me was that, I mean, being at sea is an amazing experience. And also that most of the men on our ship became our brothers and our comrades and would come to our aid if we were being harassed by crew members from other ships. So that was a great experience. That's good. Yeah. 
So I wouldn't give any of that back. It was pretty a pretty amazing time. To go back, were you in the writer's mindset? I was actually more into reading and embroidering then. So yeah. I also do a lot of costuming and hand sewing and things right. like that. And the easiest thing to take with me at that time, and we didn't have personal computers back then because it was 1980 and uh, we didn't have access to things like that. So the easiest thing for me to take was needle and thread and do a lot of embroidery and I could get my hands on books. So I did a lot of reading and a lot of embroidery and things like that. So let's get into your what you do best, which is your books. Tell us about the books you have written and your connection and inspiration to the strong female characters that you write about. People ask all the time about, especially fiction writers, about you know who they're writing about. And the, the real answer for me is that every single book has something autobiographical in it. So in The Healer's Legacy, which does deal with a woman's journey out of an abusive relationship, we don't focus on the relationship. We, we focus on the journey. Um, that's written from practical experience, and which I think is why I'm able to do it. But the other thing that people ask me often is, why don't you write about the Navy, your time in the military, things yes. like that? For me, fiction, especially fantasy, is a way to get arm's distance from a situation or an issue and explore it from all sides and try to understand it and make it accessible to other people in a way that's not off-putting yes. and in a way that's not too emotionally traumatic to actually write and or read. I know that seems odd. No, but. I get it. I mean, you're given a message in a message for those that are in someone can catch it if that's what they're going through in their lives. Right. And if, if you just want a great adventure, you can read the book and get that. So it's a journey. It's an adventure. There's some little bit of magical stuff going on. There's some uh, fun and stuff. Some of the female characters, to me, the way that I took it, they're strong, but then they also have this self-doubt about themselves. And I'm like, you're so strong. Just go for it. Just do what you need to do, especially with collars and curses. It's like she's really strong, but then she's so hesitant to really go out and do what she can do because her parents, you know, she's worried about her parents. And so there was a mixture of, yes, they're strong fem female characters, but that at the same time, they kind of go through the same struggles that every normal, you know, woman would. Well, it, and that's the point, right? We, When I write my characters, first of all, my characters come to me as voices in my head, and I pretty much have to write their stories before they'll get out of my head. That's kind of my process is I come from character. These are people who become real to me in, in, a, in some wonderful ways. And the main character in Collars of, and Curses, Marissa, I want to have been her when I was growing up. Right. <laughs> She's got this snark to her and this humor and this uh, pot, this really um, confident side to her. And yet, like all of us, she does have those places where she doubts herself. As a writer, I doubt myself constantly. I think most of us do. Most artists have that self-questioning, that, that self-doubt that one day we'll be in love with the work and the next day we hate the work and we... We work really hard to find who we are through our work. So while I write what I consider strong female characters, they are very real to me, and real people have real flaws and <laughs> right. real doubts and real problems. How do you keep up with your characters? Because you said you you know they're all in your head. You know, do you write them down and do you write their characteristics down? Do you keep some kind of spreadsheet. You're a grants writer, so I'm pretty sure you do have a spreadsheet somewhere. <laughs> well, it's funny that you should say that. I have a character cheat sheet, especially because uh, the, the secondary and tertiary characters in my books need, I need to track them. I don't want to suddenly turn somebody's eyes a different color or their hair a different color or make them a different height or, you know, give them a different attitude than, uh, but they're very basic character okay. sheets. So it's just the basics. But I also keep now, I keep a 
a Pinterest. Is it Pinterest? It's yes. Pinterest, yeah. yeah. I keep a Pinterest page where I actually keep pictures of who I think these characters would might look like. Well, like that's awesome. On a work in progress page just for me on my Pinterest site. So I have I do that, or and I've kept files on my computer. When I was writing Mirabella and the Faded Phantom, there's uh, the ghost is from a specific period in time. So it's a historical to that extent. And so I needed to know what the hairstyles were, what the clothing was, what the music was, what all those things were. And I put that on my desktop and had it in front of me. And I had music playing during this, the ghost scenes. I had a specific piece of music playing. You'll have to read the book to find out which one <laughs> uh, <laughs> to get the mood of that and to get the energy of that right. So I do some of that, but for me, it's mostly, I feel like a journalist following my characters around and just writing down what they say and what they do and, and what happens to them. I, I'm very much not about writing out the plot first. I'm one of those people that is mostly a, what we call a pantser. And I write, that? I write by the seat of my pants and I just, <laughs> just sit in the chair and start writing and go wherever the story takes me. Uh, unlike a, a number of people who I know, like Joe Junta, who I co-wrote Supernal Dawn with, who's a plotter, and he's a very devout plotter, and he just plots everything out, and he knows what's going to happen, and he knows his world, and then he writes the outline from the plot, and then he writes the story from the outline, and a few things, details might change, but he knows where he's going. I generally have no idea where I'm going when I start a book which made it really hard to write the second and third books of the Healers series, especially the third book. That one, <laughs> that one was tough because I... Why? Why was it tough? Well, for one thing, I'd set up a lot of expectations in my readers, I think. And, and you have to get the reader out of your head when you're writing because you, you have to write the story that you have to write, that you need to write. For me, anyway. I need to get the readers out of my head because the judgmental and the, oh, I didn't want the characters to do that, you yes. know, it's kind of thing. Well, it's interesting you say that because we were talking about that offline on how you create work and then you have the hesitation of the judgment of, of, or something about whatever characters you have already given the reader. So talk a little bit more about that. I try to teach and I try to preach that you should write the book that's in your heart. I'm not what you would call an author who writes to be commercial. It would be lovely to have a commercial success. But for me, it's about writing the book that's in my heart. And it's it's very character driven. It's the characters who get inside my head. But when you write characters, especially characters who are diverse or different, there's a hesitation in putting that out into the world. What will my readers think? What will they, you know, because again, you know, readers know me through my books. They know me through my books. What will they think? How will they react? Well, have I done it right? Have I done it well enough? Have I represented this diverse character in the best way that, um, you know, I don't want to be cliche or stereotypical or do any of the things that might be offensive, but I, have, I want my characters to be very real as well. So I work very hard on that. And so, yes, handing a book to someone when you don't know how they feel. For instance, The Healer's Legacy deals with abuse, and you're handing it to a woman standing next to a very large man sometimes and saying, oh, it's about this woman's journey to try and escape from the local warlord. I never say abusive relationship when I'm telling people about the book, but they get it when they read the back. And you don't know if the man standing next yeah. to that woman is an abuser or not. You just don't know. So you don't know what you're handing people sometimes. Uh, is this a key that's going to unlock some really great doors for them? Or is this a, a key that's going to unlock some scary doors? I, I once had someone who posted on Facebook, it was very sweet, a uh, woman who had read my book, and she said, it's that moment when you look up from reading a book and realize you've just had a traumatic experience and the rest of the world is going on about their business. And she wrote that about The Healer's Legacy. And I about cried because that's, yeah, that's very meaningful to me. Yeah. That feedback is what keeps you going as, a, as an author and as an artist. Let's talk about rocket shoes for a second oh my god that's a wonderful children's book can you talk about that so rocket bit? shoes is a picture book and it's targeted at uh 
four to nine year olds. And it's the story of a little boy who wants a pair of rocket shoes so he can fly. And his mom makes him work really hard to get the shoes and he loves it. And then the, the neighbors complain and the mayor bans those shoes as a nuisance. And then a big storm comes and Jose, the character, the main character of the book, he has to decide whether or not to put those shoes on in order to help his neighbor. So it's it's not only a fun story about getting shoes that make you fly, but it's also a little bit of that where I grew up, question authority kind of thing. And when do you when do you break the rules to do the right thing, you know? Yeah. And and is there a time to do that? So I always wanted to write a picture book, but one of the things people don't understand is picture books are hard. Good picture books are one of the hardest things to write because you have somewhere around 500 to 1,000 words to tell a complete story with a compelling situation, an engaging character, all of that, and still leave room for the artist to illustrate it. It's not an easy feat. So I have some very bad picture books sitting in a drawer (laughs) (laughs) and some not so bad but just not saleable picture books sitting in a drawer. But I was in a workshop one day just by accident because I was the you know facilitating to make sure everybody you know was comfortable and the door didn't slam and that sort of thing and the, the person who was giving the workshop said let's play the what if game so I thought I'll play along and I thought well what if we had shoes that would let us fly and I knew right then that I needed to write that book, but I had no idea who the character was. And it was the first time I came with a concept before character. But the story started to come to me about a little boy, and and I still didn't know. And so it sort of formed slowly over time. And it came to me in rhyme, which, because my, my background is in poetry, I was a little hesitant about because Rhyming picture books have to be done really well or you can't sell them. Rhyme is so interesting. Good rhyme is not easy for picture books. It's real easy to try and you, s- shove the story into the rhyme rather than using the rhyme to tell the story. But Jose's story came to me in rhyme. And I used to have some neighbors in Tucson. So the mother in the book... It's her voice I hear when she says, Ijo, I'm not buying crazy kids shoes just for flying. (laughs) It's like, I know this woman. (laughs) I know exactly what she would sound like because that's what my neighbor sounded like. So That's what my mother would sound like. (laughs) And I told you that my brother's name is Jose. So I connected with the book and I could hear my mom's voice saying, Ijo, you know. (laughs) Buying crazy kids shoes just for flying. You know, and, and the rhythm of that is just, it's her voice so strongly. So that's, you know, I, I did start channeling characters once the characters got into the, the, the story, but it was a hard book to write. It took two years. It takes oh, wow. as long to write a good picture book and get it prepped for sale as it does a good novel and get it polished up for sale. Um, but I did get my agent pretty quickly once it was done and we sold it very, very fast. We got an offer in our first round out, which is, is nice. Yeah. One thing that you mentioned about the book is the illustration was something that was done by someone else and you didn't really took part in that journey, but that you were glad with the final layout. Right. So what a lot of people don't know about picture books is, especially as a first time author, you don't get any say on who they pick for the illustrator. You don't get any say. Uh, this is if you're with a traditional publisher. You don't get any say with what the art is going to look like, what the final layout will look like, what the art director is going to do with the book, anything like that. There's a there's an old story I like to tell about uh, an author who wrote a book about a swimming school, and she th- pictured all of the characters as kids. And when it came back, they were fish and it was a cute book and she loved it, but she didn't know that was going to happen. And so I kind of say, I like to say Lego, your ego is a requirement. So when I sold the words, I knew that they were going to, it was going to be out of my hands. Yeah. The contract said in font, it, you know, that it said, well, we're going to let you know who the illustrator is, but it didn't say anywhere that I got to have any say over that, yay or <laughs> nay, or make any suggestions. 
So they picked an uh, illustrator who's just amazing. His name is Ward Jenkins. He lives in Georgia, Atlanta, I think, but he's in Georgia. And he used to do, for those of you who are old enough to remember, Mm -hmm. uh, he used to do animation for a program called Space Ghost Coast to Coast. And he now does some storyboarding for the My Little Pony movies and, and stuff. Yeah, so he's very, very talented. No, he did an awesome job. He's very talented. But um, they actually sent me the thumbnail sketches when they were in the process of determining which ones to use. And they let me weigh in on a couple of options for some of the spreads, which honestly, I don't know if my opinion weighed a feather or a (laughs) rock, but uh, I was really happy with what, what he did. And of course, the characters don't look like how I pictured them because I picture everything in my head. I do. I'm a very visual writer, but I couldn't be happier. He, they did such an amazing job with that book. Yes. It's a fun book, book. even for adults. It doesn't have to be for kids because I enjoyed it. It was about the mayor and, you know, being a government employee. I kind of, you know, uh, it was fun. It was really fun read your poetry book. In case you didn't hear me the first time to me provides a personal insight of your life experiences and personal thoughts. I'm curious to know like which one was harder to write. Oh, the book poetry. Well, you have your children's book, you have your poetry book, you know, which one is, is hard to put together? Well, okay. So they're so different. The, the poetry is, it's, is, oh my gosh, that's such a great <laughs> question. Okay, so I want to I want to really be really clear about this. That poetry book is a compilation of of essays and poetry that were written over time. Compiling it is hard. Writing it in the first place is difficult, but compiling it in a way that makes sense in your brain that has a message that you want to get across is is very difficult. Choosing what to put in and where to put it and lay out and all of those things. Writing a, a novel takes multiple revisions and a love-hate process that I go <laughs> through with every single book. And editing and revising and revisioning and then copy editing and and getting feedback from beta readers and rewriting it and <laughs> getting oh feedback God. from the editor and rewriting it. And so they're both difficult in their own way. Uh, the poetry book had some very difficult topics in it. Uh, There's a poem in there called Another Grandmother Poem. And the reason that it's called Another Grandmother Poem is because when my grandmother was dying, I wrote multiple, multiple, multiple things. Because she went into, um, she went into, it wasn't quite a coma, but she was not conscious for, I think it was almost two weeks uh, as she was dying. And we did not have, a good relationship. My grandmother was not a kind person to me when I was a child. And so we always had a lot of static between us. And that was a very, very difficult poem to write. How old were you when this was happening? Uh, When my grandmother died? Yeah. Um, Gosh, I must, I was in my thirties. Okay. I was in my thirties when she died. The, The thing is, is that everything in that poem is very true. The fact that when we would go to visit her, that she would ask how we found her. She would say that, how did you find me? I mean, I hear her voice in that line. How did you find me? She'd ask. And we'd have to explain again who who we were. And, and she didn't know that the people in her life had died or any of those things. But, you know, she always did remember the real color of my hair. And she would say, oh, you dyed your hair. So there was just this <laughs> strange stuff that she did and didn't remember right. in those final uh, years. Uh, I needed to come to terms with our difficult relationship. And that was the process of writing. And so as a, as a writer, that's a lot of what I'm doing. None of those other poems or essays or any of the other things I wrote about her during that time have ever seen the light of day. That one poem, that one poem encapsulates. And I think it was the most cathartic moment. And it was the moment of realization because at the end of that poem, I, I write, I wonder if, if, after, if I'll remember who I am after all of my anger is gone. And the meaning behind that is that she'd forgotten that she was angry and that she was an unhappy person at parts of her life. And she was just who this person that you could go and say, right. yes, remember me? No, she really 
she did, but she didn't. And, but she also didn't remember all that other stuff, you know? So anyway, it's a little poignant and it's a little, it's a little deep. That was, that was deep and it's good. I mean, there was some poetry in the book that was deep, you know, came from a hurt place. Don't know if you want to talk about that a little bit, but it, it just with when I read some of it, I just thought of you, Sharon, and, and and I just I was like, you know what? I feel I feel in my spirit that you had a very harsh life, and I don't know if if that was what was going on in certain parts of your life and that has come across in, in certain characters in your book. But I just just got that feeling of there was some anger. Um, there was a little bit of wanting to be love. I just got a little bit of all of that. Is is there any truth behind what I was reading when I when I was reading your poetry? I'll be very honest with you. Yeah, poetry bears the soul for me. And I think the greatest poetry bears the soul and the emotions of the poet. And I released a lot of that. And there were poems, there are poems in that book that I wasn't sure I wanted to put out in the world in a book and let the entire world know who I am at that level. And I think maybe one of the the, that may be also one of the reasons I don't write as much poetry now. I write the fiction because I can get that arm's length from some of it and I can still get the catharsis that I need from the situations. Plus, I don't know. I, I just, once my characters got on the big stage, they were like, I I need to stay here on the big <laughs> stage. So, uh, you know, once I wrote my first book, I was like, oh God, I've got to play on the big stage for, from now on. Uh, I still do write a little bit of poetry now and then, but uh, yeah, it, all of that dark stuff, it's all from deep inside of me. I gave, I made some choices in my life that were choices that led me to have a very difficult journey. Um, there were some things that happened as a child that, you know, I think set me on that path. And I I think, you know, one of the reasons that The Healer's Legacy is the book that it is, is because it is, it's, it is that type of soul bearing information, but it's buried a little bit in the story of another character. And so I can share that part of myself, in a in a way that's not quite so much like ripping out your heart and handing it to someone. Yeah. And poetry is a little bit like, you know, yes. ripping open your chest and just, you know, here I am. And it's a way of healing, you know, you, yeah. you write your thoughts down and I think everything that you do is, is awesome. And I read through it. So that's why I'm giving you, you. <laughs> I'm giving you my insight because as I'm reading it, I'm like, I feel her. I, I feel what the message is, it is that she's trying to say. Thank you. And so for that, I honor, I honor you for that. I, I, I have to tell you how much I, I love hearing that because I always tell this story about as, as, to aspiring writers about um, how pe- different people come to the work differently because we all have our own lenses in how we view the the art. You know, I, I see some art that I'm like, I don't even know if that's art to me. You know, <laughs> art right. is subjective and writing is art. Yes. And so different people will come to the work differently and some will be deeper readers and some we, we have our own lenses through which we see. Some see it just as a, oh, a good fantasy book, whatever. Um, some people get a deeper message. And however anyone, whatever you take away from the work, whatever anyone gets out of the work, my, I have two things to say about that. I always tell writers, if somebody, if I were a painter and I painted this abstract artwork and Somebody told me, oh, I love your art. I love it so much. I, I, I have to show you this place of honor that I put your artwork. And I go and I see, and they've hung it upside down. What would I say? You know, my reaction is, I'm so glad you love my work. Thank you so much for honoring it, honoring me by putting my work in a place of honor in your environment and in your art. Um, I'm not going to tell them it's upside down. Because they get from the work what they get from the work. And so with the books, I feel the same way. And so I love when people come and tell me that they've connected, though, because 
Simon Sinek does this TED talk about knowing your why mm. in anything you do. And my why is to have an emotional connection with the reader, to reach out and and touch people in a way that is uh, the way that bo- I feel about the best books that I've read, the books that have really resonated with me. Yes. And we talked about that offline because Collars and Curses, when I read it, I told you I have ADD when it comes to reading Squirrel. You know, I'm I'm horrible at it and I enjoy reading books. But the books that catch me are the books that when I'm reading, I'm actually in the room and with the characters. I can visualize everything that you're describing in the book. And that's what I got with Collars and Curses. And I am hoping that this becomes a movie one day because I really think it's awesome. Thank you. Well, I um, I consider myself a visual writer, and what I mean by that is that I work very hard. I know this sounds a little counterintuitive as a writer, but I actually work really hard to make the words disappear on the page so that the reader is seeing the story happen in their brain because that's how I see the story happen is yes. as, as almost like a movie in my brain. And so I actually work to try and make that happen. I try to pull out anything that would distract the reader from visualizing the story. I try to pull out anything that would push the reader out of the story because I want them to stay inside the story because I think that that's the best journey, right? Staying yes. inside and not getting distracted and not getting kind of kicked out of the the journey or the right. story. Yeah. Do you think that's your philosophy in regards to your books, that that's what you look for? you know, for people to first visualize what's going on in the story so they can be part of it. Is that what your ultimate goal is when you write your fantasy books? Well, the ultimate goal is to have that emotional resonance. And so uh, the craft portion is making it a movie in your head. Does that make sense? (laughs) Yes, it does. (laughs) So it's, there, there are multiple things that we do as writers to, Because language, and written language especially, is a way to transfer information. It's, But again, everyone comes with their own lens, and, you know, different readers read differently. I know there are people out there who don't ever visualize movies in their heads, uh, even when they read my books. Although I had one person tell me, wow, it's the closest I've ever come to seeing a movie in my head, you know. So that's a nice thing to hear. Uh, but, But that's because I'm trying to transfer... It's like, I don't have ESP, so how can I get what I'm seeing into your head? Right. right? <laughs> but but really, it's about making that emotional connection because that's, again, back to as a child, where my friends lived was in books, and I want my characters to be that for someone else. Well, I think you've done that. Thank you. With me anyway. <laughs> um, I, you mentioned something earlier about having your file drawer full of of stories and, and characters. Did I hear that correctly? Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. curious. <laughs> I'm curious to know what's in there, you know, and what inspires you to go through that file and say, you know, maybe it's time to pull this one out. Well, so for the books, it really is voices in my head and everybody's kind of queued up and kind of knocking at the door. And so I'm always working on multiple things. Um, You talked a little bit earlier about the ADD. I am a little (laughs) that way. And um, what's nice is that if I'm working on one story and I get a little stuck, I can go back and work on something else. Also, I try to keep things at different places in development so that I can continue to churn out. I'm going for a book a year. You know, I've got this goal. Right. You know, as long as the publishing, uh, you know, publishers work out, agents work out, things like, you know, I have things in different levels of development as I'm going along. But it's also partly because that's my process is I'm so ADD. It's like I can't work on just one thing. And if I get stuck, because I believe that 80 percent of the writing is done in the subconscious brain, only about 20 percent of it is actually putting it on the page. And then later the revisions and the revising and all that. So there's a ton of stuff just in my head, ton of people knocking around in there. And whoever's knocking the hardest at any given moment is who I'm working with. Uh, But I do also have a file, a physical file full of ideas and thoughts. And I jot notes down all the time when I have these ideas for stories, because you never know if I play the what if game with me, with myself. I mean, because that's how Rocket Shoes came to be. 
But the strange thing is, is that when I pull from that file nowadays, I usually end up writing some sort of poetry or flash fiction off of that. Okay. And that goes very dark very quickly. And I don't know if that's a palate cleanser for me <laughs> so I can write the other things. But um, those ideas turn into usually short fiction. You mentioned about ideas mostly come from the subconscious mind, which I think is so deep. <laughs> How important, because thoughts, you know, you could be driving and something, you get this idea like out of nowhere. And I think it's so important for people to, and I've did this just recently because someone else mentioned the same thing that you mentioned about getting ideas that is just coming through to have a notepad in your car so you can write it down because that idea that's coming in quickly could turn into something big like it did for you for rocket shoes. Yeah, so I used to have to, because you can't really write while you're driving, so well, not that's a good true. idea. Well, but, I, I do it, but, but I shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I used to end up doing these mantras in my head, but I, I did theater for a, many years. I did community theater, and I, I started acting in school, and I really enjoyed it. And I learned to do my lines by repeating them over and over in my head and adding to them as I went along. So I used to have to do mental notes in my car when that stuff would hit. And I would repeat them over and over and over until I got somewhere where I could pull over or to my next stop. And then I would write them down. That's a good idea. So, uh, but now we all have smartphones. You can just say, Siri, take a note, right? <laughs> or oh, or whoever you have on true. your phone, right? So Android or whatever you have. I don't know, you know, all there. I'm sure there are different things. But now you can just say, take a note. But uh, for many years, uh, I did carry a sound activated tape recorder because the whole car thing got a little difficult because I might forget. I was still forgetting sometimes. So I, I got one of those little... Uh, recorders, the and they don't record a ton of stuff. They're just a, a few minutes worth of recording, the digital ones. And I would, be, that's before I had a smartphone, when I had a flip phone. I would use that. Okay. And so that's a great place to put that stuff. Right. And, uh, you know, and I still jot things down. And sometimes I've, I've been known to write something on my hand or a napkin or whatever <laughs> there's available. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. You dabble in other artistic mediums. Talk to us about those other areas of interest that you have, because they are a few. Okay, so back to ADD. <laughs> I want to do all the things. I want to make all the things. Uh, and I have tried to explore many, many different art forms, including painting and drawing and uh, stained glass and costuming. I've done a lot of costuming. I a few years back, I was the steampunk fashion coordinator for Com of, uh, Phoenix Comic Con, back when it was still called that. And my buddy uh, and I, we actually steampunked out uh, the characters of The Wizard of Oz for that. Nice. Yeah. So, so that was a lot of fun. I still like to do a little bit of that. I, I like things that I can do with my hands. Okay. I I really, I I. I've done some clay, some sculpting, very bad sculpting. Uh, <laughs> some, <laughs> I want to throw pots someday. I want to, you know, I want to do all the things. Yes. And so I have, I've got jewelry making materials. Do you think I, that gives you a balance? Yeah, I think that for me, sometimes I just need to do something kinesthetic with my hands mm -hmm. to, that's creative, still creative, to get, let, give my brain time to work on the stories while I'm doing that, again, back to that subconscious churn back in the back of your brain where you're not really thinking about it. And just, I, I've done flat beaded bead work. I've done beaded earrings. I've done you know, little things that I can just focus on and do with my hands that let the brain work on other things. It's very, for me, it's very, um, it's almost meditative. Right. Yeah. Can you talk about the films? <laughs> because that was... <laughs> I was amazed by that. Um, it's two of them, right? Yeah, they're they're. Um, let's see. There's um, sacrifice, which is a more or less full length homage to B movies. It's a giant monster movie that we we even did went on location for. And I was part of the writing team. I was part of the. I did the costuming for that. I did the a lot of the props, most of the props and s sets. I did a lot of the sets for that, uh, and some of the makeup. Did I say makeup? Yeah, makeup. Uh, and I was a character in it. Uh, I had how, did, a, how did you get connected with that? That's amazing. Well, you know, artistic people kind of run in circles, the same <laughs> circles. And uh, Bob was doing the movie and, you know, uh, 
So we we decided to do that. So I <laughs> so I have lots of credits in that film. Um, and then uh, what the other one is um, called Yellow Sun. Oh gosh, what's it called? Yellowstone. Yellowstone. Yellow, Yellowstone. Sacrifice Sunset. and Yellowstone. Yellowstone Sunset. I think, or something. Anyway, um, I was really, I just did the props, and uh, I was the voice of the computer in that one. That was a lot of fun. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to have to watch it. Because that's a little science fiction-y one, yeah. <laughs> well, my, I, I got to tell you, my daughters and I used to make uh, movies. Okay. Uh, and uh, at one time, we went through this phase where I was making movies with them, and I'd got, because I had a camera, video camera, so I was making <laughs> movies. And we did two uh, that were Edgar Allan Poe based. And the first one was called um, The Pillsbury, uh, it, it was called, not Pillsbury, it was called The Doughboy. And <laughs> it's a, it, we, we took and we, re, we rewrote <laughs> The Raven. Uh, as the doughboy and oh it's actually pretty hysterical we had a lot of fun with that we had so much fun with that we decided that we were going to do another one so we did the telltale heart as the telltale sock and we did it with sock puppets so we did <laughs> God. so we rewrote it so that it would work with sock puppets are you going to post so that on social media well, so we can see <laughs> the, cha the challenge with that is that with i did the Back in the day before I understood uh, rights and all of that yeah. stuff really well. <laughs> and uh, I've not posted because I've used uh, other people's music. Like Poe, I don't know if you're familiar with the singer Poe. No. I used her song in as part of the Telltale Sock. So I can't put that out into the world. That wouldn't be, even if I don't sell it, I don't think that I can put it out in the world. I don't think that would be appropriate. It's one of those things that you're just going to have to not, you know, set up a time and I'll, I'll, I'll show it to you. Yes, please. I want to see it. <laughs> what advice would you give to inspiring writers? What tools would you suggest to someone who aspires to write a book or explore a career in creative writing? It's a journey. First of all, it's not one and done. Uh, when you write your first book, it, you can, it can be real easy to be, you know, do the happy dance, do the touchdown dance, and then send it out. And that first book is, um, I can pretty much guarantee you, is not going to be saleable. It's not going to be done. It's not going to be, you got to put it, you got to revise, you got to rewrite. Writing is rewriting. Uh, it it's doesn't come out fully formed and perfect. Study your craft. Go to workshops. Right now, the libraries have this, you know, the state of Arizona has a wonderful program called the Writer in Residency Program. Oh, I didn't know about where that. Where they put, I just finished uh, three months over at the Tempe Libraries as their Writer in Residence, where okay. I spent 16 hours a week doing workshops and one-on-one -on -one consulting with aspiring writers and teaching and all of that. And so there are a lot of opportunities to go to your local libraries and do uh, the, the programming there with... As, this Arizona State grant for the writers and residents. Right now, I think uh, there's a writer at Mesa. I'm not familiar with her. Her last name is Pullman, I think. And then there's another writer, uh, Betty Webb. She's over at Tempe. And so different libraries have different writers doing this. And it's usually spring and summer. So you can go to free workshops and those kinds of things. That's really, it's important to know your craft because there's a lot of craft behind the structure of a novel. My first novel was bad. It was, it was so bad it was not saleable. It was, it had lovely characters, of course, because I write from character and it had, uh, it was very creative because I have a creative imagination, but I didn't understand the structure of a novel. I'd only written poetry and short stories at that point. And the structure of a novel and the craft of a novel is very different. So know your craft, study your craft, learn your craft. Uh, you don't have to go out and get a degree like I did, although it can't hurt you. Uh, if you have electives that you can take while you are studying whatever your degree area is, take creative writing classes. There are a lot of opportunities out there. There's a lot of resources online for that as well. But study your craft, get to know your craft, trust, uh, and then trust yourself to to do it and do it well and know that you're not going to be perfect first time out the gate. It takes time. Are there any networking opportunities for aspiring writers that they can maybe... There are a lot. There is the Southwest Writers Group. There is, if you write romance or anything that might have any romance in it, there's Romance Writers of America. If you write for kids, uh, and that's anything from 
zero up through age 20 because now new new adult is a a thing and yeah so um but uh so picture books middle grade young adult new adult there's the society of children's book writers and illustrators and that's the organization that i am the regional advisor for for arizona how as a writer and author how how do you promote how do you market yourself with great trepidation and difficulty (laughs) Uh, (laughs) we writers most of us are really more on the introverted side we're not extroverts we're not out at the party dancing in the middle of the room going <laughs> Woo-hoo, here i am um so uh, plus this is your art is your heart it's it's part of you you've put yourself into it especially if you write like i do which most writers put something autobiographical in their books uh, i always say it's not really right what you know it's right what you feel you're handing your heart to someone when you hand them the book and again you don't know what their reaction will be because you don't know what the lenses are that they are coming to the work with in front of their eyes, their life experience and how they will filter the message or not filter the message. You know, you don't know. And so, but you do, you start at all the free events. You start at the, you know, the low cost stuff so you can learn how to talk to people. Don't hide behind your books, talk to people, make eye contact. If you know what, you're the champion of your story. You need to, trust that you've done something great here and that you've done something once you've done all the editing and revising and polishing and you've had some good feedback from beta readers not your mom (laughs) unless she's my mom my mom will tell you tell me what's wrong with it um you know if i ask her so that's you know that can be a double-edged sword there (laughs) i i recommend that you you trust that if you've done your due diligence and worked really to put out the best thing you can then be willing to put it in somebody's hands. So you pick a social media. The The best person, I would say, the guru of social media for uh, authors is uh, Jane Friedman. She does a blog on that, and she does she's amazing. And there are also forums out there that you can get on and find out how other people are doing it. There's no right way or wrong way to do it. You have to do what works for you. I like the in-person events. I like teaching so when I teach, I always say, and I have books for sale. <laughs> you know, um, right. it, it's not easy, but you have to learn to do it. When you do your teaching events, do you have that on your website? I'm I do. Okay. My website has all my upcoming appearances okay. always listed on it. Right now, there's not a lot listed because um, I'm going to be taking a little bit of a hiatus for the summer. Okay. But uh, I'll be back at it in the fall and going on tour again. So I'll be doing book signings at Great. bookstores across the Southwest and I'll be doing some events. There's the Mesa book festival in December, December 14th. That's okay. coming up. So I'm excited about that because nice. it's the third year for that uh, new little event and it's grown and I'm very excited to do that this year. Um, so I do also um, to some festival of books, LA times festival of books, San Diego festival of books. Uh, next year I'm hoping to do the uh, Bay area book festival does tucson have a book fair like it's supposed to be like a huge book fair it's one of the biggest in the country yes when is that it is in uh april the first part of april every year i think um march or april i want to say april but i think it i think that's la march it's early march okay yeah la is in april so yes and it's free to go down there and wander around and they have I mean, it's huge. It covers most of the ground of the U of A campus down there. Wherever there's space, they put booths and they put people and they have, it's great to take kids to because they have a whole area of STEM stuff and puppet shows and just okay, and all this crazy stuff. So, and there's food. Yay. Oh, we like, free? Is it free? No. Oh, well. No, you got to buy the food. <laughs> but, the, but you know, it's that good food that you, it's that fun food like kettle corn that you can get okay. at an event. You know, that is, <laughs> And, uh, but they have some, you know, good hummus. They, they had really good hummus this year. So you mentioned, um, Comic Con and is that a place where do they hold workshops? I've never been to one. So. Yes. Well, they do them like mostly like panels. They do have, uh, the last couple of years they've had some authors doing a uh, writing track that you can participate in. There's an extra fee for that, but, okay. um, they also do panels that are free that are just 
authors getting up and talking about sitting up there talking about their books. I've been uh, lucky enough to be on panels with people the likes of Brandon Sanderson and Diana Gabaldon and um, probably butchered her name again <laughs> um, and people like that. So Jennifer Roberson, okay. some wonderful people at the different events that I've been at. David Brin, if you're a science fiction person. <laughs> so um, so that's a good avenue. I'm name dropping now. <laughs> oh, oh, um, R.L. Stein and Jonathan Mayberry. I was on a panel with them recently. So right, right. I'm like R.L. Stein. I can do a panel <laughs> with R.L. Stein. He's he's as funny in person as you would expect. The one down at uh, the Tucson one. It's free to attend though, and it's two days, and it's pr pretty amazing. But Comic Con, uh, yeah, it's not called Comic Con anymore. It's I think it's Fan Fusion now. Mm -hmm. And so Phoenix It's Fan been on my bucket list to yeah. go to a, a to a Comic Con. Well, I'll be there again this year. It's okay. in two weeks and it is uh four days. It's Thursday through Sunday. And you can buy a one day ticket or what whatever. And we'll be in I'll be in the vendor hall in the Brick Cave publishers booth. So I'll be down there. Are you dressing up? Oh yeah. Oh. oh yeah can not, you tell us not what? as much as i dress up for the <laughs> renaissance fair for the oh books. i love when the I, renaissance i do a, i do a book signing out there every year too okay. but um yeah uh uh <clears throat> ann chamberlain who owns the bookstore brings different book uh different authors out each day of the, of the fair and she brings me out one day a year to to hang out there so yeah i always have to be in full regalia then <laughs> but no i'll do something steampunky or you know something like that a uh, different something different every day at the at phoenix fan fusion oh, probably man. i'm gonna have to go just to see what you're wearing <laughs> <laughs> okay so one again it, you know you're doing so much you've done so much and so one fun fact about you is that you ran a coffee shop here in mesa <laughs> anthology cafe that focus on supporting spoken word and open mics and poetry slams. I just learned about this. <laughs> what? And I missed this. Yeah. So it, it's, it's, uh, it was on main street right across from uh, Mesa city Plaza. And it's where the, it's that building that's kind of next to the Mac, but it's, and in front of the Mac, it's now empty. Benedictine university was using it for their, um, for some of their uh, programming uh, initially. Okay. But um, if you were to tear up the carpet on that floor, mm -hmm. you would see poetry written all over the floor. Oh. So what we did when we opened that is because we founded it on poetry is we sent out the call to poets across the nation and had them submit a line of poetry to put on the floor of that cafe. And then we had a bunch of local poets come in and with big markers write the poetry down with the name of the poet on the floor. And then we sealed it with a, a clear coat. So, yeah, so <laughs> there, I know, amazing. right? So it's still there because they only carpeted over it. They didn't okay. like tear the floor up or anything when they moved in. So if anybody ever tears that carpet up, they're going to find this oh wonderful poetry. Uh, but yeah, we brought in, we had poets, uh, touring poets come there from all over the nation, they would travel through town and they would, we would set them up with a show and we did, uh, they would come in and perform. We had group, group performers. We had, we had slams there. Uh, Is there any chance of that ever coming back? I, I think that's so needed. <laughs> I, you know, it's, it's, it was a, it was a work of love and yeah. it, it didn't make any money. It, it, it lost us money and it was so time, uh, labor intensive. Mm. I don't know that I have it in me to give like that and then to not be able to do it. Uh, it lasted three years is all we were able to do it for. At some point you had, we had to let it go. And yeah, because there's, I, you know, I, I you have love, to pay for, you know, everything. Yes, that's true. Uh, you have to have a venue. So events that are single night events that you can go do at somebody else's coffee shop are a lot, a lot more cost effective for poets because poets don't make money. True. They don't. They don't make a lot of money, so. Well, when we first moved to Arizona, I, we moved from Atlanta, Georgia, and poetry, word, and open mics is really big in Atlanta. And so when I moved here five years ago, I'm like, where's the poetry places? And Yeah, so it, we, we ran a, a slam from 1994 until we closed that coffee shop in 2000 and I don't remember, 12? Oh, so Something I was like that. Um, but there was, there used to be, it used to be a very robust 
poetry uh, community. It's not, I mean, I think it peaked already here. And so it's okay. not as robust anymore. I mean, the challenge is, is that you have to have people willing to be the organizers to show up whether anybody else does or not. There were nights when we first started doing poetry and open mics and slams where there might be two people and we would be reading our poetry to each other, yeah. you know, because nobody would show up and, right. and and you have to build that community and then you have to keep that community and, and keep it going. And it's a lot of work for the organizer. So it, that also is an act of love. And it, at some point, it just changed for me where my focus was. I, I moved away from the poetry. So I know there's still a poetry community out there. I, I know there's still slam out there. I'm just no longer engaged mm -hmm. in it because I'm focused on the books because that's where my characters want to play on the big stage, you know? <laughs> right. So, um, so I know there is an active community. I just don't know. I couldn't even direct you at this point. Right. Yeah. What is next with you? What do you have in the works? So I'm working on several things right now. I'm working on a steampunk middle grade book that is top secret. Nobody gets to know <laughs> what it's about uh, because I'm so excited about it. I think it's going to be like my big thing, but nice. I get that way about a lot of books. Um, <laughs> this is going to be my breakout book. Oh, well, it wasn't. So, okay, that's fine. Let's just go to the next thing. I'm also working on the next book that's actually going to come out, which is fully edited and they're working on the cover now, I guess, uh, is the third book in the healers trilogy and it will be complete at three books. And I, I, I really believe my readers will be happy with the way the story ended. I was surprised and pleased with the way the story ended and what the characters you know, the, their journey and what they went through. Because again, I don't tell them what to do. My characters tell me what they're going to do. I just kind of have to follow them around and, and make it work. <laughs> I have to have my Tim Gunn moment, <laughs> make it work. Um, I'm working on a second book in the Collars and Curses series. Um, I want to tell Bree's story because Bree, I don't think, got a fair shake in the first book. Um, and I want readers to understand her and know her journey because there's a lot going on with Bree that we didn't get into. And there's still more to Marissa's story that we can see from Bree's perspective. I have a sequel coming out to the Nelig Stones uh, probably early next year. Oh, That's wow. done and waiting for artwork. And so we're, I'm excited about that. And then um, what else am I working on? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I do dream of writing another picture book that someone will love enough to put out into the world. But, uh, you know, you never know. That's awesome. Everything you do is just great Thank and inspiring. You. Is there anything else that you would like to share with our listeners today that we perhaps didn't touch on? If I were to impart anything, just do it. You know, people say, oh, I'm going to write that book or I, I want to write or I don't know how to start. Sit down and put words on the page. They don't have to be good words. They just have to be words on a page. Everybody has their own process. But you got to start somewhere to figure out what your process is. My process changes with every book because the characters are different in every book. But I think it's important for you to just do your art. And if it's not writing, if it's anything else, just do it. Just put yourself and that creative spirit out into the world. We need more art. The world needs more art, I think. And those who are, are doing it should art harder. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I, I stole that from s multiple sources. Uh, Scott Woods <laughs> says it, and I, I know a couple of other people who do. Um, so, and he's he's a fabulous writer and poet and organizer and all those things in Ohio. He's in Ohio, but I I also want people to know that there is a craft to writing. If you want to do it well and you want to reach an audience and you want people to come back to the well for more, you got to know your craft. But I always say, you know, I, I, I forget whose quote this is. It's not my quote, but tears in the writer, tears in the reader. You I know, like it. If, if I have an emotional connection and I ha I'm having the feels while I'm writing and I let that flow out onto the page, then I believe my readers will too. So I think that emotion comes across think that's important but really just let yourself let yourself be creative do it trust that you know and even if you don't do it for anybody else I mean Mary uh, um, who was the poet who uh, oh my gosh I can't think of her name ah! 
I don't know. I anyway, don't know. Um, she wrote for herself. She put them in a drawer, and none of her poetry was published till after she died. She was a spinster, and you know now she's a classic poet that we read. Um, and I can't think of her name right now because I am drawing a yeah. blank because um, it's all about me right now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Ah, sorry. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. It's been a wonderful hour spent with you and learning more about you. And I can't wait to read what's coming. It's going to be great. Thank you so and much for having me. And please, let's have collars and curses <laughs> made into a movie. Yes, yes, let's do that. <laughs> Universe, you heard that here. So. <laughs> thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. Please visit the website at www.leveluptribes.com and please subscribe to the podcast and share with your family and friends. Be sure to tune in to our next episode. Catch you all next time, my beloved tribes.